Fireworks. That's what my Tennessee self said as I heard gunfire ringing out in the streets of inner city St. Louis. I didn't want to believe what I was hearing, which was gunfire. And so I grabbed my wife and a student who was with us, and we were out doing evangelism in inner city St. Louis on a mission trip. And we literally jumped into bushes out of fear. We didn't know what else to do. We, we saw people running for cover, and so we found a hedge of bushes, and we got behind them, and we were hiding, and we were just waiting for the church van at some point to come pick us up, and they eventually did. And we were on a, as I said, on a mission trip in inner city St. Louis, and at this time, it was uh, the place, we didn't even realize this at the time, but it was the place of the highest gang violence in America during that time. And we took a mission trip there. And in that, in, in, on that day, someone had decided, they had woke up in the morning and they had decided they were going to rob a convenience store. Well, the convenience store owner said, not today. And when they came in and they tried to rob the convenience store, the store owner just pulled out a gun and began shooting in the air and shooting at the people. And this is the gunfire that we heard as we were running for cover. What just so happened, a few streets over, my friend Wayne Cole, some of you have met him. He spoke here on Mother's Day, I think last year. He found himself in a similar predicament. He had been sharing the gospel on a street that we were told was run by a a certain drug dealer, and I don't remember his name, um, but but we were sharing the gospel on his street without permission, and someone had come up to him, and they said, if you're going to share the gospel here, you need to talk to this guy. You need to meet with him. And just the way Wayne is, he's, he's really not scared of anything. He said, well, what's his name? Where does he live? And, and, and the people pointed to a crack house, really a crack house down the street. And they said, you need to go knock on the door and you'll have to go in and you'll sit in the living room and you'll wait for this guy to come out and you can meet with him to get permission to, to do whatever you church folks are doing here. Now, at that point, I, was, I would have been done. I'm not doing that. That's not something uh, I, I would take part in. But that's not Wayne. He went down the street, knocked on the door, and went and sat in the living room of this drug dealer in this crack house. And he had a meeting with him and negotiated with him. And, and finally, we were given permission for the rest of the week to share the gospel on this street. The only thing they told us is... When the street lights turn on, you guys have to leave because you may get shot. And every night when the street lights would come on, all the kids in the neighborhood, they would run home. And that was time for us to get out of this neighborhood. And so these are two stories that were happening virtually simultaneously. And what was interesting is our meeting back at the church as we tried to decide what we were going to do. Wayne and his group showed up, and we asked them, how are you guys doing? You know, we heard gunfire today. Are you guys okay? And Wayne said, yeah, we are great. We just left the crack house. (laughs) What are you doing at the crack house? Well, we had to meet with so-and-so. Why did you meet with him? Well, we got permission to share the gospel on his street all week long. And so we can do all of the ministry that we want to here this week. We just have to go home at dark. Now, I was humiliated in that moment. Because up until that time, I had been talking to the group about changing plans for the whole week. I had decided this is too dangerous, we need to go, we need to go to another place. You know, St. Louis, Missouri, there's Six Flags, let's go spend the week at Six Flags, we can call it Fellowship and Fun, it'll be great. We can even find a church that needs some painting somewhere, but we've got to get out of this place. And I'd already been talking about that, and here is my friend, 
who isn't scared of anything, who, who's like, no, we're staying here. We're staying here and we're doing ministry all week. And the whole group said, yeah, let's stay here. You taught us that the loving kindness of God is better than life. Why would we leave? I remember all week the, just being humiliated and embarrassed by that moment. And I, I remember going out in and, 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 and just fear and panic. What are we doing here? And almost being embarrassed by it. When we come to the passage that we're going to look at today, we see two different responses to persecution. We see two different responses to, responses to what it means to witness the truth in the face of of danger in the face of persecution. We find one standing fearlessly before the highest religious court of the land. We find one who is willing to stare down Rome, willing to stare down execution without any fear. And then we find one who's ready to hide in the bushes, one who is embarrassed and scared. Notice verse 53, and then they led Jesus to the high priest, and we've talked in the weeks past about Jesus praying in the garden. We've talked about being betrayed by Judas. Judas has come with the religious authorities. He's come with temple security, and they have arrested Jesus And here they're taking him to the high priest, which is Caiaphas. Caiaphas oversaw the temple. Caiaphas oversaw all of the uh, political affiliation with Rome. And they lead Jesus to Caiaphas. Now, the terminology is very important. They led him. And we are to think about Isaiah 53, a lamb who is being led to slaughter, the Passover lamb is being led to slaughter. Notice the text continues, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. These would be representatives of the Sanhedrin who we've talked about in weeks past. They were religious representatives, 70 of them plus one, which would have been the high priest. They They were the Jewish Supreme Court. Now, what's interesting about this is we know from the other Gospels that Jesus has already stood before Annas, which is Caiaphas' father-in-law. He's already stood before him. And Annas is this sort of uh, mafia uh, overlord who runs things from behind the scenes. And as Jesus has stood in the temple and he has condemned Herod's temple and he has condemned the religious activity that surrounds the temple, Annas is infuriated, and he is seemingly behind most of this, and he wants Jesus dead. But they have to get the chief priest ruling first, and the Sanhedrin to rule first. Notice 54, and Peter had followed him at a distance. Mark wants us to remember and notice that there is one who is still trailing behind. And we're asked the question, what's going to happen to him? Why does he mention him here? As Jesus stands trial, why is Peter referred to here? But notice the text says he is at a distance. He is moving further away from Jesus. And here he is in the courtyard of the high priest. It would have been a lower level as Jesus is in the home of Caiaphas. He's out back with guards by a fire with others who are turning against Jesus. Verse 55. Now the chief priest and the whole council of the Sanhedrin, here is their motive. They were seeking testimony against Jesus. They were seeking some truth to put him to death, but notice they found none. And we're beginning to see what a farce this trial is that Jesus is on. You have to have two witnesses agree to put him to death. But here from the very beginning, Mark says they found no testimony against him to condemn him to death. And to make a false witness meant you yourself were to be put to death. But notice 
Verse 56, for many bore false witness against him. And so who, right off the bat, who is guilty of death here? Jesus is the just, the innocent, standing before the unjust, the guilty already. They could not agree on their testimonies. Notice verse 57, and some stood up and bore false witness against him saying, we heard him say, I will destroy the temple that is made with hands and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about their testimony, they did not agree. Here we see kind of a garbled false witness. Of course, it's lies. We know Jesus did say that the physical temple would be torn down. It would be wiped out. He said God would bring judgment against Jerusalem. He did say those things. But he never said he himself would do it. And he said he is the temple that's not made with hands. He was referring to his body. But they can't get it right. It is this distorted uh, falsehood that is being lashed out against him from everywhere, and it doesn't fit together. We know from Luke, they also brought up the falsehoods that he was inciting riots, that he was against paying taxes as he claimed to be king. There were more falsehoods, and so there is lie upon lie upon lie. And what's also interesting about the way this trial begins is it wasn't even supposed to happen at night. The trial was to happen in the middle of the day. There were to be no secrets. Everything was to be out in the open. But here the religious leaders are working behind the scenes in secret. And they can't agree. And there are no witnesses. There's really no judges or prosecutors or defenders. It is a rushed trial overnight. And why is this? Remember, they don't want the crowds to know anything about it. Because they know they will revolt. They know they have chanted Hosanna to Jesus. And they don't want any part of that. And so they rush this trial overnight. And the high priest stood in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer? Have you no defense? Can you bring clarity, he says here? Can you, can you bring some kind of clarification about what they testify against you? What in the world are they talking about, Jesus? Are you not going to defend yourself? And notice verse 61, but he remained silent and made no answer. And we're to remember Isaiah 53 again. This lamb that is led to slaughter Isaiah 53, did not open his mouth. He remained silent about the accusations against him. And if you're like me, you're going, what in the world? You're going to let people lie about you? Make stuff up? You're going to allow this conspiracy to kind of run wild? And exactly, that's what the high priest asked him. What are you, what are you thinking? And so he just gets to the point and he says, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? If you're not going to agree to any of these other things, you're not going to admit any of these other things, let's just get to the point, Jesus. Are you the Christ? Are you the son of the blessed, the highest one? Are you God's son? Are you God's king? And notice Jesus said this, I am. And we are to think about Exodus. As Moses stood before God and said, who am I supposed to tell them who you are? What is your name? And God said, I am who I am. And here we see the I am in flesh which means I do everything that I say I will do. And here we see him doing everything he said he would do as the Christ, as the Son of God. But he goes even further. He says, you will see the Son of Man. You will see me seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds. He says to the Sanhedrin, 
You look pretty in your robes. You got all this power. By the way, you're hiding at night. And right now, you stand as judge over me. There is a day coming when the sky will open and the Son of Man, the Most High, will stand in judgment over you. And this same terminology is used of Jesus in talking about his second coming and the way he will come in and replace the temple. But all of it points to his royalty. He is a higher power than them. And Jesus leaves no doubt who he is. But we see here he is in total control of the situation. Remember throughout Mark when people are asking, who is this man? Who is this man who casts out demons, who tells winds and, and waves to obey him? Who is he? And it's almost kept a secret until this moment where Jesus declares with great clarity who he is. I am the Son of Man. I am God's King. And he doesn't hold back in any way here. He unleashes it because he's in control of the moment. He knows at this moment, as he tells the truth, he knows what's coming next. This is the moment that he steps up and says, that's who I am. If you guys want to kill me, by the way, you're making a mockery out of this trial. The, the trial is fixed so that they win. They are cheating, and they can't win cheating. They can't win their fixed trial. They can't even get it together. And by the way, Jesus hasn't lied at any time. If you just asked him, he would have told you who he was. But they're so clumsy, and Jesus is so direct. And one of the things we see here is that the truth is more scandalous than even the false accusations. Well, we heard you said, don't pay taxes. We heard you claim to be king. We heard that you were going to revolt against Rome. We heard that you were going to tear down the temple and build it back. We can't agree on any of those things. Well, Jesus says, let me tell you something even more scandalous than all that. I am the Christ, and I will judge you. Of all the things that you can get in a back and forth with people about these days, this is more scandalous that he is the Christ. And maybe that's why we don't like to talk about this. A lot of times you get in conversations with people and, oh, you're a pastor. That meant, uh, you know, what, what kind of pastor? We're, we're a Southern Baptist church, so that means that you're a conservative Christian. Yeah. So you, you believe abortion is wrong? Yeah. So you believe that God determines gender? Yeah. So you believe that um, homosexuality is a sin? Yeah. So does that mean that you hate women and you hate the LGBTQ community? Does that, does that mean that you, you hate all these people? No, not at all. But let me tell you something even more scandalous than all of those things. I believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Christ, and that he has come and he has died for your sins. And if you do not believe in him, no matter what your, your sin is, no matter what your worldview is, if you do not believe that he died for your sin and is raised from the dead, you will be judged by him. That is more scandalous than any sort of debate, cultural debate that you can get into it with anybody with. But I wonder why we don't just declare the truth. Maybe it's that it's more scandalous to us than the world. Do we believe the truth that he is the son of God and that we will stand before him and give an account to our witness? Notice verse 63. And the high priest tore his garments. Now, this was a, a sign of judgment and specifically, it is a sign of heresy or a high offense to the court. It, it would have been so everyone could see this is the last straw. What, what he just said is too much. 
And this would have been a sign of blasphemy, of despair in in the context of the court, in the context of the temple. No one could declare blasphemy. And no one could declare that they were God themselves. And so before everyone, this is horrible. And this man deserves to be torn and condemned and separated from God. And he says, what further witnesses do we need? We don't need anyone else to try to tell us the truth because he told us the truth. And he says to everyone there, you have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And so in a formality, he, the high priest looks to everyone else and says, what's our decision going to be? Well, everyone knows the decision because a heretic, a blasphemer, was to be stoned to death, was to be killed. And here they know what's coming. And notice they all condemned him as deserving to die for his blasphemy. And some spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him. What they do here is they begin to spit into the face of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. They begin to treat him as a common criminal. They they begin to, to treat him as a blasphemer that deserves to be humiliated. It, it, in this way, and spit is running down his face, and as spit is running down his face, they cover his head almost to say, we can't look at you anymore, and then they begin to hit him. They begin to punch him in the face, and as they strike him, they say, prophesy, which means, tell us who hit you if you're such a prophet. So where's all your little magic tricks now? Surely you know which one of us just punched you in the face. Surely you know which one of us just struck you. You're a prophet. You know all things. And they begin to unleash upon him fury and whip and beat him. Now as we we read these moments headed to the crucifixion and we have these images in our mind, Jesus being mocked as a fake prophet, a fake king, we begin to cringe, and we begin to feel sorry for him. There's an emotional response that goes on here that is good. We have to remind ourselves that Jesus is a person, and that they are rejecting a flesh and blood person. And we have to remind ourselves what that rejection looks like in flesh and blood as they punch him and they spit on him. This is what rejection of Christ looks like. When you reject Jesus, you're not just rejecting someone's bullet points on a gospel track. You're not just rejecting a religion, a worldview, someone's opinion, someone's theology, an ancient story of days gone by that's in a book. No, you are rejecting a person with a face, with a beard, whose hair follicles are pulled out. You are rejecting a person who had spit and blood running down his face. You are rejecting a person. And this gives us an even clearer picture of what rejection looks like because Jesus is accused of blasphemy. And to blaspheme God meant to bore holes into God's name. And here we're faced with a question. If you're here today and you believe Jesus is the Son of God, he's not the blasphemer. It is those who are rejecting him. And they are about to bore holes into the name of God in flesh and blood. And that's what you do when you reject him. You blaspheme him. You say his name is profane. You say this person who is pure and just, that he is the one who is unholy, who is profane, and deserves to have holes born into him. That is what your rejection is. It is to blaspheme the Son of God in flesh and blood. And you can, in your mind today, think of all the sins that you need to repent of. You can think about your most horrible moments in life. 
they don't compare to the spitting and the beating and the mocking of the Son of God that you do as you reject him, the blasphemy that you are guilty of. This is what condemns you to die. But Jesus is condemned to death here. But then all of a sudden, the narrative moves back to Peter. And we think, why? Why does Mark include it here? Verse 66, and Peter was below in the courtyard, maybe wondering what's going on with Jesus. And then there's a slave girl of the high priest. And they come to Peter and seeing him warming himself by the fire, she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene. Now, What's so important here is Peter is hiding away, and yet all of a sudden, the light from the fire shows on his face. And all of a sudden, his identity is revealed before this slave girl. Not the high priest, not the highest court of the land, but a slave girl. Who is she? Who would have ever known her story, even if... Even, even if if she comes to him and she says, you, are, you were with the Nazarene, and, and he said, yes, I was, who would have ever known? But Peter, like the court, is hiding in the darkness, and he is scared of the servant girl. He is scared of her accusation that you were with the Nazarene. You were one of the, the hicks that followed him around Galilee. I know by seeing your face, I can tell you're one of them. But what does he do? Verse 68, he denied it. Jesus declares who he is, but Peter denies who he is. And he says, I neither know or understand what you mean. I don't know what you're talking about. And notice, he went out into the gateway and the rooster crowed. First of all, Peter was at a distance. Now he denies him and he moves further away. But as he does, there is the rooster crowing in the background that should be a warning to him of what he was doing. There is another witness, and it is the rooster. And the rooster is telling Peter who you are. You can't hide. Verse 69, and the servant girl saw him and began to say to the bystanders, she's not going to keep quiet. You jerk, you just walked away from me. You didn't answer my question. Hey guys, this, this is one of them. Here's another one of them. He's followed Jesus of Nazareth to court. But notice verse 70, and again, he denied it. Moves further away. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. As you talk and as you deny this, we can tell by your accent who you are. We know by the way that you're talking. We've seen your face, and now we've heard you speak. You are one who has been with Jesus. You, you are a Galilean. You walked with him in Galilee. You did ministry with him. But Peter again and again denies it until verse 71, he began to evoke a curse on himself and to swear. Now, he just bust out in a probably laced with profanity, cussing. That's what we say from Tennessee. But notice how it's described here in the ESV. He invokes a curse on himself. Peter now is telling the truth about himself. Peter is, is blaspheming himself, so to speak, in saying he deserves to be cut off from God. He deserves to be separated from God. And he, he continues, though, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And here we see the truth about Peter as he is moving at a distance further and further away from Christ. He is cursing. He, he is pronouncing himself guilty. He himself, with his words, I do not know him. As he denies him, he himself is separating him from Jesus, separating himself from God. In verse 72, immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down 
and wept. The rooster tells the truth. Actually, Peter tells the truth too. As he denies Jesus, he deserves to be separated from God. He deserves to be the one that has the holes born through his name, through his person. As we, we, we summarize here, we see there are two trials that are happening here. Jesus stands as a faithful witness, and Peter stands as a failed witness. We see two different witnesses, one who, who boldly declares who he is, and one like a coward who denies who he is. And we wonder, why is this? Why did Jesus predict this? Why is Jesus allowing this? And we've seen something with Peter throughout the whole story. Peter, over and over, is going to tell Jesus how things are going to go. You are the Christ. You are the Son of God. Well, that means I've got to go die. And Peter says, no, 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 no. You're not going to die. You will deny me. I won't deny you. All these other fools, they'll deny you. But I will not deny you. The soldier comes. Take Jesus away. What does he do? He takes out the sword. We will fight. We will win. You are the Messiah. Over and over, Peter has told Jesus how this is going to go. And down to the last crow of the rooster, Jesus is trying to tell Peter, it's not about you, son. You don't know how this is going to go. And as you trust in yourself and you have all of this great bravado and confidence and courage in yourself, Jesus is intent on humiliating him until he understands, Peter, you can't stand. I'm the one that's got to stand. You can't do it, son. Think about that. Jesus is standing and Peter can't stand. And this is the point Jesus has been trying to teach Peter all along. And he is at pains to teach him this. He is at pains to say, I'm the one that has to stand. I'm the only one that can do it. I am the only son of man, the only king. And maybe that's what's going on in your life right now. Maybe there are things in your life where you are trying to stand... And yet, over and over, you are faced with the reality, I can't. I don't have the power to stand up to what I'm up against. I can't fix the problem. And maybe those things that you are pushing against with your worry, maybe those things that you are pushing against with your control, if I could just worry about it, if I could just, if I could just manage my finances better, if, if I could just fight, if I, if I could just somehow grab control of this situation, I can fix it. And yet the very situation you're fighting against is a gift from God to tell you, you can't stand. It's not about you. It's about Jesus who stands for you. Maybe those things in your life that you're fighting against are God's gifts of grace like they were to Peter. Maybe as you look at your life and you're trying to figure it out by your own wisdom, not his story. Maybe, maybe God's saying it's not about you. It's not about you. This isn't your story. This is a story of Jesus. Maybe those hopes and dreams that keep dead ending, they dead end because they're, th this isn't about you. This is about Jesus who has stood for you. And maybe that sin in your life that is just haunting you. Think about Peter from this moment until he sees a former corpse. This, I never knew him haunted him. You even see as he runs to the tomb, he is haunted by something. And maybe there is sin in your life today that is haunting you. And what you're telling God is, I can do it. Give me another chance. I can do it with a little more accountability, with a little more discipline, with a little more grit. And all of these things that we're standing against are meant to teach us the gospel. 
that you can't stand before God with your own power, your own righteousness, the things you do, the things you don't, to do, don't do. Only Jesus can stand for you. So what difference does it make to be humiliated as Peter? To have this story told of you again and again and again. I never knew him. I never knew him. I never knew him. What difference does it make? Well, on Easter Sunday, Peter plans breakfast with a former corpse. And as he sits down to eat with Jesus, he stares into the eyes of one who stood for him and is back from the dead. And he begins to understand something. I'm not the king. And what difference does it make? Well, we see at Pentecost this one who I, did, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. He stands empowered by the Spirit, and he stands before leaders like Caiaphas. He stands before the Sanhedrin, and he said, you cowards, you met at night, you killed him. You killed him. You are the ones that killed him. And we see this one who is scared and humiliated all of the sudden because he understands Jesus is the one who stood for him. He is willing to stand for Jesus. Now, maybe the things in your life, you're struggling by your own power. Maybe you need to begin to see these things. You, you think, well, this moment... In my life, with such a great difficulty, the diagnosis, the conflict, the strife, the finance, these things I'm trying to fix, and, and again and again, I'm realizing that I can't. You've got to begin to understand those things aren't punishment. Because God hasn't promised to make you a success. He has promised to make you a witness and like Peter, you will not witness the gospel until you are humiliated by your own power, by your own courage, by your ability to stand in and of yourself. Witness comes through failure just like resurrection comes through crucifixion. And that's what makes us who we are today. Your witness and your stand before others in, in your work and in your school is not, look how great I am. Look how amazing I am. Well, you're such a godly person. Why, well, yes, I am. You should be more like me. That's not our witness at all. Our witness is of those who have failed over and over and over again and just can't get it right. And like Peter, we, we try to watch from a distance. But sooner or later, someone is going to turn to you and say, were you with him? Were you with, do you know him? And it is your humiliation that's going to say yes. Because you're going to say, it's not about me. It is about him. And our witness is this. We have come to learn that the worst life could throw at us has already happened to Jesus. Your witness is that he is the only one who could stand before the highest court in the cosmos and be killed for blasphemy under the wrath of God. And he's still standing. And there will be times in your life where you, like Peter, will not stand. You won't stand in the garden. You won't stand before Caiaphas as a witness. But your testimony is he stood for you in Golgotha. Golgotha. 